Well, no sermon series on Methodism would be complete without an explanation of the symbol I referred to when I spoke to the children that's there on your bulletin cover. It's the foundation for all Methodist belief. And I will say this, there's nothing unique about it, nothing at all. Every single Christian, no matter how much they swear that the Bible is their sole inspiration, they all do the same thing. They all adhere to this quadrilateral. Let me explain. So the gospel of the Lord and the word of God found in scripture, these things are living things. Have you ever heard that the word of God was a living thing? Anybody? Okay. Let me tell you, for those that uh, didn't hear that before. So living in that they're not dead, of course, because dead things are static, you know? When you think of something that's dead, it's static, it's unchanging. It's almost like a snapshot of something that was once alive, but if you were to call that snapshot representative of the thing in life, that would be kind of wrong, right? It doesn't fully encompass what that thing was in life. You don't take a picture of someone who died and expect that photo to give you information about their life. That's ridiculous. No photo can. You can make assumptions based on appearance, of course. Oh, look at that scowl there. That must have been a very angry person. But they might have been very nice. They just didn't like to smile in photographs. I've known plenty of people like that, my dad included. And, you know, if you knew that person, the one who had been photographed, you had an experience of that person. You would know that the snapshot truly is not representative of who that person was, but more specifically, who they were to you. And the same is true of the living word that we are all bound by as Christians. So living in that we continually experience it, we allow our experience of it to inform our present. And we believe that even now, so many years removed from the, when the words were first captured in print, because they weren't always in print, you see, before they were passed down through an oral tradition, later they were captured in print, translated, etc. Even now, these words have something to say to us. Scripture devoid of life, well, it would just be a very disorganized book of poetry, tales, legends, fables. But when we allow the Holy Spirit to bring what we learn there into our present, well, then it has the power to transform, to inspire. And that's where the rub lies. So when we experience the Bible like that, it can become our truth, but not the truth, if you know what I mean. So in my experience, the Apostle Paul had it right when he wrote the following in 2 Corinthians. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us. So, a person's testimony about God may be very powerful, but it will consume you if you stray from the path the Holy Spirit is attempting to lead you on. When we read scripture, we must be careful not to allow our ideas of how it applies to us to cause us to assume that our experience of it is standard. So everyone reads scripture differently because, hey, we were all made differently. The nature of God that I ponder is likely very different from the nature of God you ponder. And yet because the Holy Spirit is so communal, you know, it networks us, it gathers us, it helps us come into one accord, 
Last week when I described the early Christian community, I said that they had all things in one accord. You know, they were trying to figure out, hey, now that Jesus is not with us physically, what does it mean to be us? How do we do this? And they began to think about what it meant to be a faith family. And Jesus said, I will not leave you alone. I'm coming to you, and I will send you the Holy Spirit to guide you. And the Holy Spirit will say well, to you everything that I have said to you. And that's from John chapter 14. Now, that ability, the ability for us to kind of discern what that means for us as a faith family, the way the early Christians did, that process is what allows us to glean something from Scripture to make it valuable to us. God's truth, of course, belongs to God, of course, but it's entrusted to us in spite of our flaws. And I always like to say about that, you know, that just sounds like a really bad idea because of the reasons I just gave. Sometimes we make our truth the truth, even when it comes to God's truth. But the thing is, God is always working to refine us, to bring out of us the very best of us, that more and more of the truth might be revealed, and God does this for every single one of us. How multifaceted, then, is our received faith when it comes to us from so many different sources and experiences that's what makes it alive. The truth doesn't just come from study. As I said to the children, they put a textbook in front of you and you are expected to remember the material and you're tested on it. Pass, fail, anywhere in between, you get a grade. If scripture was like that, it would not have life. It does not come, the truth does not just come from study, it comes from the Holy Spirit informing our experience of Scripture as it informs our lives. Now, John Wesley, one of the founders of Methodism, wrote the following in his Explanatory Notes Upon the New Testament. They liked their long titles back then. He writes, The Spirit of God not only once inspired those who wrote it, but continually inspired supernaturally assists those who read it with earnest prayer. Hence, it is so profitable for doctrine, for instruction of the ignorant, for the reproof or conviction of them that are in error or sin, for the correction or amendment of whatever is amiss, and for instructing or training up the children of God in all righteousness. Have you encountered that idea before? This idea that when we read scripture, God is there helping us to understand and interpret, not just to get the truth, because that might never be possible for us because of our sin, but to help us to experience more and more of the truth, helping us to understand, to push past our ignorance. So that's to say that the Spirit offers its own testimony as we create ours, from what we read in the book. And let me tell you, I love this notion. Oh, I love it. I have always loved the idea that God is invested in our success in faith, always trying to help us to get it right. I mean, frankly, I don't think I could be a Christian without it. And right, I would say for two very important reasons. One, because Look, I believe in a God that cares about the world, all of you, the world, and me, right? Me, in the thick of it. God is there for all of us, and for you specifically. And then secondly, because I hate know-it-alls. Let me tell you, you know, self-assured people who think they've cornered the truth, oh, you hear about them all the time. I used to be one of them. I think I'm still working on it. The witness of God reminds us that no matter how much truth we think we've found, 
it will never be God's truth. This idea of a greater power, greater than us, makes me feel like, hey, I don't have to be right all the time. I certainly don't have to be perfect, because that was never the point. I am who I allow God to make me into. Or to put it another way, if I want to be right most of the time, well, then I need to listen, not speak so much. Now, I learned of the quadrilateral when I was just a boy. We haven't always talked about the quadrilateral in Methodism, so if you ever heard about it and you thought, oh, we've had it for a while. No, it's a recent invention. I dare say it's not even 30 years old. It was an attempt at a certain time in our history to distill what the core of the Christian faith is for the Methodist believer. You see, there was a time in congregations where people from other faith traditions would join us and they'd say, well, what is it about Methodists that makes them so different? And the average person in the pews couldn't really tell you because none of the stances that other churches had, um, well, we just didn't seem to have any stances whatsoever. And so there was an attempt to try to understand where the sources of our faith came from. Now, I will say that the quadrilateral was based on an older Anglican theological tradition. So when it was explained in those days, experience, meaning our personal experience, had absolutely nothing to do about our source for faith. Oh, they couldn't be bothered with that. It was just scripture, tradition, and reason, which when you think about Anglicanism's roots, King Henry VIII, and the standardization of what used to be Catholicism, then when it became the king's religion, yeah, it makes kind of sense. You don't want everybody's personal experience tainting what the church, and specifically the leader of the church, had to say about it. One way to do things. Well, that might work for some, but not in a democracy, right? Well, John Wesley decided to add a fourth point to, to that triangle, and he emphasized the role of experience to our faith. It had to belong to us, too. For United Methodists, Scripture, of course, is always going to be the primary source of our belief system, as it should be for any believer, or there's no foundation. But Scripture becomes part of us in these three other ways. So let me explain the relationship here. Tradition is the experience and witness of so many nations and cultures as they encountered and added to the Christian heritage as they matured in faith through the ages. The reasons that we have all these different things, they're all just distilling from a source long ago, peculiar to us here. Much of what we believe about the Bible, in fact, comes to us from these additions, from these, some might call them, innovations, because so few people actually read their Bible. And that's not a condemnation. I don't read the Bible all the time. How many people have time to sit down and read much of anything these days? But I certainly do it each day for, actually, if you want to know, 20 minutes a day at least because it's a spiritual practice for me. And then, of course, the research that goes into my sermon or a question that someone might ask me about a part of our faith. But most of what we understand about the Bible comes to us from our traditions. Now, reason is what helps us to discern if what we're learning from these testimonies actually makes sense for us. Experience itself is how we appropriate what we find in Scripture. It is the very lens through which we view Scripture when we actually allow it to speak to us. To us. The four elements of the quadrilateral taken together help us to develop a mature faith. Did you know your faith is supposed to be maturing? A mature faith. You're supposed to think for yourselves with your head and your heart. And to be frank once more, to develop a compelling understanding of our faith. 
compelling in that we can share it with others, and they find it inspirational. The testimony that I bring to you as a pastor is only going to be compelling if I actually allow God to speak through my experiences. Otherwise, it's just story time, you know? And that's what God did with Jesus. So that those who hear the words encounter a desire to appropriate God's word too. It's the beginning of evangelism. Jesus spoke out of what he knew as he attended synagogue in his youth, later became an informed rabbi, and began to develop his own ideas about what this word meant for the world in which he lived in, full of poverty, inequity, and the like. That's what drove him. And in our world today, as I watch churches close, or I see pundits on TV distort the words of scripture for their own ends, I am not surprised when I see fewer and fewer people compelled to find their faith. Consider the young and how low a priority their faith is for them. They might not even recognize its value. And why should they, if we fail, to offer a compelling narrative, which is why we must go back into scripture time and again to understand the lessons there and how they apply to us. Now to sum it all up, I learned the following phrase in school, that the living core of the Christian faith was revealed in scripture, illumined by tradition, vivified in personal experience, and confirmed in reason. That's a direct quote, by the way, from our Book of Discipline. This would be the book of our denomination. It's not a holy book by any means. It's actually just the means by which we govern ourselves as an organization and where we can find our core values, what makes us us. We have articles of religion. There are 25. No, I'm not going to read our 25 doctrinal statements. You want to read them? Go look in the Book of Discipline. You can Google them, too. 25 Articles of Religion, UMC, comes right up. When Jesus began his teaching ministry, or in other words, when he began to interpret what he read in Scripture to other people, his testimony, his good news, came from Scripture. But hey, he wasn't just making it up as he went along. He took what he had been taught and he made it compelling through the Spirit's witness, through God's own Spirit talking through him. We need to remember that when we decide to equate the New Testament with the good news, we might be in error. You see, there was no New Testament when Jesus taught. It hadn't been written yet. He was speaking out of what we call the Old Testament. He might have called the Hebrew Scriptures. He was teaching out of what he had learned, and he did it through Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And what he learned there in those sources, they dictated his mandate. That was found in our Gospel reading for this morning. It is the same mandate that inspired the Holy Club at Oxford, later called the Methodists, to gather and work toward making what they had learned in church compelling. So, what was the mandate? Liberate the poor. Bring freedom to prisoners. Give sight to the blind. Not just the physically blind, but metaphorically too. Fight oppression and let people know that God cares deeply about them. And they did it in their own way, in their own time. And we do too. We take note of what we see around us and in our world. We allow the influence of God's word to compel us forward. Here at Epworth, we do that in a lot of different ways, and especially over the years. Right now, we're helping students have what they need to be able to learn and prosper, 
to give their parents and or guardians a little bit of relief as they look at the growing list of needed materials in each school that they might not have the money to purchase. We feed people. We extend compassion through financial relief. We'll collect offering today during Holy Communion in that basket right there, and that goes to UCAN, an organization that helps us to do that. We stand up for what's right by sweating and perhaps even bleeding by working on homes for people in need through our participation in the Baltimore County Christian Work Camp. These are just some of the things that I've observed since I started in July. We show compassion for each other. I've seen it time and again, where you learn about each other's difficulties, and you pray for each other, and you embrace each other, and you speak kind words. And we worship together. We hope that the Spirit of God would not only lighten our loads, but illumine our minds and deepen our love. Like Jesus, as he said at the end of the gospel reading there, we fulfill scripture together too. We are the very fulfillment of scripture. When Jesus was accused in that passage of blasphemy in his hometown, that's what happens in the verses following the gospel reading. He's accused of blasphemy in his his hometown after reading those words from the prophet Isaiah. I find it very interesting that those words were the ones he was being held to account for, take care of the poor, free prisoners, etc. I mean, some might have thought he was elevating himself, you know, in some way, but what he declared was that any person made good by God would be compelled to do those things. And the people that heard him, they didn't just hear self-righteousness, no, suffer no illusions about that. They heard a rebuke. You see, sometimes that's what learning does, and I think it's supposed to. It reminds us that we don't know everything, especially about the subject we're learning about. It convicts us, especially when we're arrogant. Ask me how I know. I know this lesson very well. All training is like that. It is humbling, and it equips us for service. Now, as we partake of Holy Communion today, I pray that we can all remember what brought us here. We're going to experience it in a way that, as I hear tell, uh, was customary for you in uh, older times. We are all caught up in one great tradition of love. We are unified by the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of grace that I encounter at the table, it's the exact same one you do. We just might perceive it a little differently because we're different people. And I must say that warms my heart. For all our differences, we are united in this way. For all our brokenness and the way it separates us, we are made whole in this bond of love. I am so thankful to be on this journey with all of you. And let me tell you, God has been revealing things to me about where we are as a church and how we can help others find Christ in this time, in this era of our history. And these folks might not even speak our language, frankly. They might not have our same customs. They might not have grown up with the same traditions. But when they are exposed to the word of God as we have been, they too will learn of the same unifying love. They might have brought it with them, and we will stand astounded at how unified we really are, despite our differences, and we will all be enriched for it. Praise be to God, and amen.